Good afternoon. I'm glad you could all join us today. It's such a wonderful day for August. Weather's kind of cool, a little humid, but we can take that. Um, this afternoon, it was Corey Gregg was going to be our speaker, but fortunately for all of you, <laughs> our president said he would come out and talk to us. So, and I'm sure I don't have to do a lot of introduction with him. I'm sure all of you know Michael. He is a 96 grad, in case you didn't know that little tidbit. Um, but he is here, and he's going to talk to you about entrepreneurship at McPherson College. So, Michael. I'm going to wander around a little bit, but you can bet you won't have a problem hearing me. So, we'll be fine in that category. So, let's, uh, let's think about how we want to do this. I need you all to think back, and some of you have heard this story, but I, 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 I'm feeling moved to share it again. I need you to think back to when you were a kid. Doris, can you do that? <laughs> you, you remember when you uh, were an architect in the sandbox? Do you remember? Yes. Do you remember when you're an artist on the refrigerator? Do you remember those squirrely little, what's that? We have ice boxes. Ice box, the ice box, pardon me. Do you remember those, those paper plates with the ruffled edges that, that you know, you'd bring home, your kids would bring home with the beans glued to them? Do you remember, remember that and how proud you were when your parents or you put your kids stuff up? And do you remember when you could sing? Nancy, why did you stop singing? Some of us haven't. I, when I was a kid, I liked to collect things. I collected everything. I collected hats. I collected pennants. I collected rocks. I collected insects. I collected baseball cards. My dad worked at a grocery store, and when somebody would quit or get fired, he'd bring home their name badges. I connect, collected those two. <laughs> collected everything. So one summer when I was eight, I decided I'd get organized. And so I decided I'd start a museum. I started a museum in my bedroom, got everything organized. And I grew up in a time where family traveled to see other family for their summer vacation. And so we had always had family coming in to, through Rossville, Kansas. And they'd come over and we'd, I'd take them through the museum. And of course, they, they love that. Who wouldn't love my museum, right? So I'd take them through the museum and Lo and behold, word spread across Northeast Kansas. A kid had this museum. And so people would just start showing up at our front door. And my mom put together a three ring binder for me and we'd make people sign in. And we had a little mayonnaise jar. And by the end of the summer, I collected $37 and 50 some odd cents in donations for the museum. So I had a lot of fun with that. And it was at the end of the summer and I, my best friend was over to the house and we were playing catch, getting ready for probably one of the last baseball games of the year. And I said, Rod, you need to see my museum. And he's like, what? I said, my museum. And he's like, okay. So we went in the house. I took him into my bedroom and you know, it was, it was um, uh, a really tiny bedroom. So I don't want you to get the wrong idea about this museum, but I had, you know, I had crap packed everywhere in that place and I, you know the tour was you go around the bed this way and then you go this way and that, that's a tour and so I gave him a tour I showed him all my collections and all the work I had done and I was really proud obviously and I said what do you think and he said that's stupid <laughs> what do you what do you think I did <laughs> yeah. I shut down the museum Shut down the museum. So why, why do we stop singing? Why do we stop building? Why do we stop creating? You know, we, we send our kids to school and we sit them at a little desk and we make them raise their hands. We make them stand in lines to do things. And we make them all use these same pencils and we start using this word, no. No, 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 no. And then all of a sudden, you got to decide, you got to pick something. So, 
you know, I, I wouldn't know what to do if I couldn't have played baseball and football and wrestling and golf and track and all those and get a duel. You know, today you know, it's like you got to pick something and then you got to pick something that you like to study. So you got to be a scientist or an artist. You can't do both or you, you're no good at that. So stop doing that. Right. And I think what happens is by the time these students get to college, they're, they're I think they're beaten up a little bit. And no, 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 it's not, not because of any one, one single thing, but they've been conditioned to think a certain way. And so when they get to college, they, they arrive on our campus and um, things still happen in the dorm rooms, right? I mean, they, 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 we, we tell them what to do and we have all the same rules everybody else has. And then they go back to their dorm rooms and they start talking about things. And I believe that our students have amazing ideas. And we need to give them the permission to try those ideas and think differently. We need to give our students a permission to make mistakes. I mean, you think about our grading system. I mean, you, you know, unless you get an A or you're perfect, you know, you're, that, that's not good. We don't, we don't encourage anyone to make mistakes, right? And I don't know about you, but I'd rather have my, uh, our students making mistakes while they're in college versus they show up for the job. And so we want them taking risks. And so what, what's happened over the last three years, which has been a pretty transformation for the college, is, is we realized, and, and I realized, and it probably is because I happen to be a product of McPherson College, that the most important part about us is the liberal arts. And if you ask our faculty, that's why pretty much all of them are there. And so the problem is the students today that come in have a hard time connecting with the idea of liberal arts. Liberal arts has this thing I call brand lag. So the way it works is 30 years later, at your 30 year reunion, you go, oh my gosh, this was such a great experience. You know, all the, and they have all these insights, but it takes them 30 years to progress through life to kind of figure that out. And so I challenged us, what is it? What is it? What could that thing be that we could do to lift up liberal arts now so that the students start seeing the value now? And so this little idea popped into my head and it's a, you, you hear it, it's commercialized now. I mean, entrepreneurship is a, is a word that is used far and wide to describe lots of different uh, activities. But what became very clear to me is that the entrepreneurial mindset, that thing uh, that, 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 that people have, is the same thing that we're trying to develop in a liberal arts graduate. The idea that we want our students to be expressive. So my kid, my youngest child, Perrin, comes home from preschool and he said, Perrin Grace, what did you do today? She said, I figured out how to get somebody else to do my job. That's expressive, right? I mean, she can talk people into doing things. Perception, the idea that, that uh, uh, students and, and people have visions um, and they see things other people don't, don't, don't see. And that's, that's good. You're perceptive. It, it, the, the idea that we want our students to be creative and think differently, and that's okay. We also want them to think critically. Uh, and the big one that I saw that was missing is the willingness, ability to at least understand risk. So you may not be the one that wants to jump out of an airplane, but at least understand why somebody else might want to do that, right? And we all know that in order to get something, sometimes we have to give something up or put something else on the table, put something at risk. And people don't understand risk and we've been raising our kids in the public school system not to understand. There's no risk taking there. There's, it's, it's very cut and dry. I've been through it, you've had kids go through it. You've been in it as teachers. There's just, there's not a lot. And I just think that that would be a good thing. And when our students get to college, it's an opportunity for us to lift up this experience that we call liberal arts with a little bit of context we call entrepreneurship with those characteristics and thing, which by the way, when I gave the Kauffman Foundation, there are $2 billion foundation in Kansas City that focuses on entrepreneurship and education. When I gave them our ideal McPherson graduate, which is a document our faculty put together 
to essentially uh, describe what a liberal arts graduate looks like. They said, that looks a lot like an entrepreneur. With the idea that the, the goal here is not to create a bunch of business student graduates. And people get confused with me. I mean, you, you guys know my history. I started a little business after I graduated from McPherson College. We grew it, it became a you know, bigger business, had a lot of success, and I come here and everybody thinks I'm a business guy. I am like as far from a business person as you can imagine if you really got to know me. I'm kind of that far from being an academic too, but that's another story. I would tell you that in every aspect of our life, we need a little bit of everything. We need to understand how business works and economics works, but we also need to understand art and science and mathematics and all those good things. And so the idea here is we want to start developing this mindset in students. And it's really the key here is what entrepreneurship is allowing us to do at McPherson College is to connect this big, ambiguous idea of liberal arts with stuff they're interested in that has meaning to them. And so what I want to do is I just want to share some of the things. And you guys are aware, aware of um, uh, what, we're, what we're doing. You see you guys follow the newspaper better than I do here. And so um, I want to lift up some things and try and draw some examples and the difference it's making uh, with our students first. And so <clears throat> you're familiar with the Horizon Fund. And I've got an exercise we're going to do together. Uh, but the Horizon Fund basically was the very first thing we started with. Coming back to my thought that students have these ideas, but for most of their life, somebody said that's a bad idea or that's never going to work. And so what they get with me is they come in, and some of you experienced this before, and they sit down and I go, that's a cool idea. If you have the courage to fill out a really quick application for a Horizon Fund, just tell us a little bit about your idea, what you think you might want to do, how much you might want to need, and then you have the guts to come in for three minutes and pitch it to me in a little committee, you might get some money to try that idea. And what's happened has been, in, in my mind, uh, and in, in my career in education has been really transformational. What, what's happened is you get students who come in who think they have a kind of an interesting idea, they don't really know what to do with it, and they turn into, you know, your Casey Max and you turn, it, you turn it into a photography business that turns into one of our students, Casey Maxson, being one of the top automotive restoration photographers in the country. He just graduated. People fly him all over the country to take pictures of cars. And he had this little idea that maybe he could start a business, uh, but it was more than that. It was, I love taking pictures and I want to see if I'm good at it, and maybe I could turn that into some money that I could use that could you know, support me in college. You've got the very first community garden in McPherson was started by a Horizon, Emily James. Some of you know Emily James, started the very first garden, community garden in McPherson. Camp. I think we have three or four now. And you can go to the website and follow these stories, but these students come in and they, on the committee, it's kind of cool, we have Dr. Kim Stanley who's this, who's uh, one of my favorites, who's, um, you know, comes from a, she's an English teacher, basically. You got Ken Yon, who is a history teacher. Uh, you got J.D. Bowman, who teaches theater. And you got kids coming in there with venture ideas. And you got me and, and Ken Eaton and Abby Archer, and they sit here, and we, we bounce these ideas off, and we tell them, okay, this sounds good. We'll give you $50, and this is what we expect. And if you come back, we might give you a little bit more. And we, we see this and we start advising them and they start getting mentors and they start working on this. And then some of them turn them into their senior projects. Some of them turn them into work that we're able to integrate in the curriculum. But what it's done is it's started to break down this barrier that nobody values student ideas. And it's, it's been something that's it's made a big difference on our campus to really start to see the entrepreneurial mindset. Now we have an entrepreneurship minor which isn't housed in any one department. It's basically a minor that any department can take advantage of. And we're going to start creating some new electives that make it um, maybe a little bit um, more um, connected with some of our majors. For instance, uh, it's likely we'll have an elective related to, to, to commercializing science. 
an elective uh, may be more suited to auto restoration or some of our more specific areas. But the idea that you could pair this entrepreneurship minor with any major, so basically creating a program of study that was cross curricular on our campus, and that's that's been a great deal. And for the f first year, we have 12 entrepreneurship fellows <clears throat> who are coming in who are already signed up as entrepreneurship uh, minors in pursuing uh, Horizon Fund. So that's really exciting for us. Other things uh, that we've done, we've, we've, we've done the Global Entrepreneurship Challenge, and, and I'll be completely honest, both of those trips, complete disasters. Not from a standpoint of they weren't worth the student's time, and they weren't, um, you know, life-changing experience for the students, they didn't work out the way we thought they would. You know, we didn't go off and start a social venture and change the world somewhere. You know, we went to Haiti and, and uh, he was really, really tough and uh, we did some really cool things and, um, uh, but it didn't exactly, the plan didn't play out. What it did, in addition to having some really good experiences for students and teaching us students that things don't always go as planned, um, Things change and we have to pivot, we have to, we have to change with them. But what it did was it reaffirmed our commitment to international work and trips and projects. So now we have ongoing stuff in Panama, we have stuff in Haiti, we have stuff in Puerto Rico, we have stuff in Ethiopia. We've got all these little clusters of places that we've started projects and we keep going back and faculty have projects there. And so that's, that's been really, really positive. And to understand sometimes when you try things, that are brand new, they don't always work out the way you want them to, but it doesn't always mean, number one, that you shouldn't have tried it, or number two, that they might not work out for the better some other way. And so um, that's been really, really great. I tell you that, so we, we talked about some of the things, and that's, that's you, you've all heard about Etch, which is basically a group of students in the, in the fine arts and graphic design, partner with some business students, and they said, we wanna do real projects, we want to have our own firm. We're going to start one. And they came in with this great idea, and there were like, I think, 12 to 15 of them. D. Irway in graphic design, Tom Whalen in business partnered together, and they put this group together. And they said, we want to focus on providing services for not-for-profits who provide resources back to us at an at a, at will uh, um, you know, donation on a donation basis, case-by-case -case basis. And so they got all organized and they came into my office and they said, we need $23,000. I said, whew, great, go get it. They said, no, we need $23,000. I said, okay, so here's how this works, guys. Part of this learning experience is you're gonna have to go out and find your own money. Well, I thought they were gonna jump across the table and you know, it, it wasn't a pretty meeting, but they got it and they went out and they raised $18,000. They're up and running and you see all the cool things that are going on with that. I mean, the, those are <clears throat> just a few of the things that we're seeding across campus. The most exciting thing for me about this, and this is really, I think, the legacy of this. And when we were going through this, and you, you guys remember, um, I met with the faculty and said, what do you think? And they said, okay, go check out some more. And I said, okay. I checked it out, here's what we've got. Okay, bring this person, Dr. Gatewood, to campus and have her spend some time. And then the faculty met you know, three years ago in the summer and said, we wanna to put together a definition and we want a minor. And so we've been, we've been moving this at, at, at our faculty's pace. Well, what's happened, and, and we got to a point, and it was either, um, I can't remember who said this, but um, um, it might, might have been uh, Kim Stanley or Ken Yon, um, and I think it was in a committee meeting we were talking about it. You know, we're talking about debating whether, you know, we should use the word entrepreneurship. And um, somebody said, who cares if it makes us better what the word is, right? And so what's happened is, is faculty have taken advantage of this. And, you know, my communication to them is you're not going to be penalized for making mistakes. We want you to go out and try things. And that means you're probably not going to get it right every time. And it's opened up this whole new way of thinking. And uh, just an, as an example, we've got an interesting project in the natural sciences. You know anything about ozone water? <laughs> well, neither do I. Um, but I have a friend who I met through uh, uh, 
Trees for Life, Balbir Math, or Balbir and Treva Math, or many of you know them, met this, this guy who we had a mutual friend and met him and he said, I need, I need a science advisor board. I've got this new project around ozone water. And so we got our faculty together in the summer. They all agreed to come in, we met. And we're gonna start a little project with a company that's coming in that's developing ozone water. They're trying to change the way we sterilize things and treat disease and it's really interesting work but the faculty are starting to get excited and integrate a new way of thinking about this and the best way to describe it is instead of your traditional types of lecture where you stand up and I'm spitting information back to you and showing you how to do things which is you know, before the internet, I mean, how else are you going to get your information? You need an expert and they need to communicate it unless you're going to do all your own reading. But I mean, Google has made, you know, education a lot different. And so it's not about information anymore. It's about experience. And so what faculty are starting to do is they're starting to change the types of experience students have in, the cl in their classroom. And what they're doing in a lot of cases is it's not so much about lecture and theory as it is we're gonna actually make something in this class so we can put back into the world. And I think that's what's really cool. And, and I'm just saying a, a theme in a lot of, you see that in Becky Bowman's class. I mean, she's been over here inter interviewing some of you couples that have been married for, I mean, that was a part of a class. They produce, almost every class she has, they produce something. We've got a class that we're doing with Trees for Life and the students are producing something and they're excited about it and they can start connecting this. And, and the class is, well, you know, we're gonna produce this and it may not be perfect and nobody may buy it, but that's okay. You know, we're, we're, these students are in college and I call it the sweet spot of their life where they have, and you, I mean, it's the same as when you guys were in school at McPherson College, the same as when I was in school there. You've got this entire community from the president down to the person who cleans a bathroom in Metzler Hall who are looking after your welfare. You're never, you've never ever had that in your life and you'll never ever have it again. And so let's try and do something, right? And so that's, that's, uh, that, that's a little bit about what's uh, going on. I wanna, I just wanna, I'm gonna take a minute and I wanna pause and I'm gonna, um, do an activity and you can just do it at your table so you don't have to move around you weren't you weren't notified in advance so I won't like you know really mix things up here but I want you I want you guys to think about an idea that you have and just go around the table and somebody surely has a, some type idea I don't care what the idea is but you have an idea and you're gonna apply for horizon fund and so I'm gonna give you about 10 minutes to talk amongst yourselves, and then you'll have 60 seconds to pitch your idea back to me. Let's just give it a try, just for, just for fun, so, all right? 10 minutes. Okay, who wants to go first? All right, Bonnie? Tell us your idea. This is Jody's idea. But we think it's a good idea. We think the Cedars needs a play place for us with shuffleboard, with um, croquet, croquet horseshoes. horseshoes, a place to picnic, a place to gather, picnic tables, a putting green. Wouldn't be real expensive. We'd have to find a place that doesn't get flooded like this last week. We've got, we've got places. Playground for the Cedars. What do you think? Hmm? How, much, how much would this cost? What's the biggest challenge? So are you going to do it? Oh, no. We're not going to do it. I don't suppose it. Merlin and I love being outside. That's what I gave it to you. Go ahead. I think we need some place to get outside. We spend a lot of time out on our patio, mm -hmm. but we could be up moving. We got out and played with the Frisbee one evening down in that area below us. People need to get out. So you guys like the idea? Yes. <laughs> All right. 
Who's next? Good idea. Dave. If you have a play place, then you need a transportation, a way to get there. And some of our people don't have transportation, or maybe they um, need another way to get there. So uh, a little four-seater golf cart, maybe in close. It could be used winter and summer. It could be used around the village to get people to places. So people could participate. So they could go to play the um, shuffle. They could go shuffleboard. Excellent idea. What do you guys think of the idea? It just, I mean, it's just a matter of, you got people who would probably be willing to volunteer, right? I'm assuming to run it. So it's a golf cart. And Chris has it on video. Oh, I forgot, I didn't, forgot we're recording these so that. All right, Doris. Well, I was just gonna add to what they've already said. A couple years ago, I was reading, was when Bud, Bud Taylor was still here. And I kept talking to him about getting some horseshoes because I'm like you, I like to do outdoor sports. And, and I would go and do, I don't go down and do the pool table, but I would do horseshoes. And I found what I thought what might be level enough. So you said, what's the problem? One problem is finding a level place. Because I was looking at one right by the gazebo so that you'd have both areas. You'd have the place to sit and have some shade from the sun, but you also would have the, the um, level. And there's a place over there that, in, not too hilly, but it could almost work in that area. And anyway, that was one thing that we were working on, sort of working on, and then it never did happen. Other ideas? Ed? Jim? No, I, I have. They both have. They each have. <laughs> However you want to do it, I'm not getting in the middle of that. Um, some time ago, I thought that, well, I believe in recycling, reusing, rebuilding, or whatever. And uh, some time ago, I thought of the idea, I've got a shop, and uh, I know how to do some things. And so I was thinking, uh, well, it was right around that time that I read about a repair cafe that they have in Europe, this yeah. idea of a repair cafe. And I thought, uh, you know, I can do that. And uh, I said something to a former neighbor, and oh, he thought that was a good idea. I, I would have no idea how to repair a computer, but uh, he does computer work all the time. He said, oh, that's a good idea. I'd drive up from Hutch once a week uh, to do computer work. If you, when you get that started, let me know. And uh, so anyway, I got excited about doing that someday when life slows down a little bit for me. I think you got your customers right here, so. What, I mean, what, what, so you've been thinking about this idea for a while. What's, what, what's holding you back? Why not? Why aren't you doing it? I've got about 97 projects okay. to do first. Okay, all right. This is one of 100 ideas, so. Other ideas? Other ideas. Okay. I had. Okay, okay, yeah. This, this is just quick. I thought it might be fun if all of us would make a bucket list and then as a project every six months, we would gather together and help one person do one thing off of their bucket list. That is a great idea. <clears throat> Maybe we would need to offer financial support. Maybe we'd need to send a companion with them so they could go do their thing. And the other one I had real quick was to build a memorial wall here so that uh, we could, um, you know, a lot of people are being using cremation and so there's really no place for the family to go as they gather uh, to kind of remember and uh, if so if we had a memorial wall we that and kind of a garden that could be the place very cool other ideas you there we go our volunteer she's got she's driving the golf cart tomorrow <laughs> oh yeah look out okay um this is kind of something we've been working on, and, and uh, we're just uh, kind of wondering how to go ahead. We have our writing group, and uh, our whole um, goal in life is to encourage people to write their memoirs, get it down on paper, because the kids and the grandkids are going to be interested one day. And if you don't put it down, you're not going to be around to share it. And uh, so a lot of us, including Marvin here, have um, gotten a lot of their lifetime down on paper and um, Marvin isn't just real sure how to go ahead to get it uh, uh, published. Uh, we know there are uh, publishers, people, printers in the area. We know that we have Etch that we can work with. Uh, I've been working with Etch for the uh, brochure 
for the, the new brochure for the Cedars Guild. And uh, so I know about them. But when you get to the place of publishing it, then you're going to get to where you're going to have money. Because uh, Etch doesn't, doesn't publish. They just help you get everything ready to publish. So um, uh, we're just sort of uh, wondering, you know, uh, how to get more people involved in writing memoirs, number one, realizing that there are some people that will not put pencil to paper for anything. Uh, um, so is there an easier way to, because I, 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 I was know. just, I was with somebody and I had dinner and they were talking about um, um, uh, modern myths or what, I'm trying to think of the right terminology, but you're, you know, it's all these stories that people have. Is there a way, an easy right. way? Taping, that be one way? Some you know, people you, do. Mm -hmm. Some people tape, tape them. You tape. need to, you need tape. to start an online company to capture, you didn't seem real excited about that. Any, what do you guys think about that idea? It's a good idea. How much money do you think you'd need to publish uh, your memoirs? Could it just be published electronically? What if you had a website and you collected it? Would you care if it was? I mean, we could, you know, we could, we could, I, I, I think it'd be really cool. We could have a portion of our website and you guys could put your stuff on there and we could direct them there and that'd be real easy. I think that'd be fantastic. Students would probably enjoy reading those stories. You got to keep them clean, PG. Are they clean? Go ahead, Bonnie. Some college students take that on as a project? Yeah, I mean. Absolutely. I mean, we got the staff there. I mean, it's just, you're, you know, there's lots of different ways to publish. Um, with sending a student out to find out about Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, they're trying to figure out how do you get into a form where you can share it with others, right? Yeah. And that's it. Lots of others. Yeah. Other ideas? That's a good idea. Ken. Oh, yep. Mary. Miriam. Miriam here. Oh, yep. Got it. Well, this idea... Uh, comes from me because I have a problem having my money when it comes time for me to eat at the cafe every day. Sometimes I forget my money, have to go home after it. And I would like some way for us to be able to pay ahead of time and have that taken care of so that we didn't need to worry day by day if we had money to go eat. She wants you all to give her money. Anybody else have that problem? I know I do. Oh, idea? I got it. I got it. Okay. Betty and I enjoyed very much the, the interviews that Becky's class made with us, but I was thinking um, it costs quite a bit of money to live here at the Cedars. Do you suppose there's a, a class in the college that would help us with our finances to uh, help us decide whether we can do certain things or whether we better hold on to the money or whether or not we even have enough to stay here. Yeah, I mean, um, I think um, I think we got a class during interterm that they do on personal finance um, that, I mean, I don't know how full it gets, but you could look into that. So your idea is, gotcha, okay, all right, Dave? I thought about the resource of college students. Um, why doesn't McPherson College send some um, students over here for um, research or for, um, what am I thinking of? What? Come over here and, and uh, learn how to work with old people, plan recreation programs, uh, internship. Okay, all right. Uh, internship program. I mean, they could come yeah. over here and we need somebody to do activities on a full-time basis or a part-time basis. Mm -hmm. Somebody who could coordinate that. What a, what a, what a way to learn and get credit for maybe even, um, or maybe learn uh, how to work with old people. Um, you guys aren't old. He's like referred to you guys as old people twice now. What? 
You, I know you got an idea. <laughs> well, uh, us old people have difficulty with names. And so we were trying to decide here what could we do to help us learn and memorize names or remember them, okay? So our ideas came like this. Uh, repeat, uh, repeat the name twice when you meet somebody new. That might help, I don't know. Relate it with a physical trait of the per person. If they have cross-eyed or something, remember that for them, their name. Uh, if Mr. Green has a green shirt, remember that. Mr. Green, green shirt. And then try to relate where they're from. And of course, we do that quite often. Then repeat the name 40 times. <laughs> what did you say your name was? <laughs> Excellent. I, um, I think that what's interesting is, is when we go through life, we're either too young or too old. Ever hear that? I know by the time people stop thinking, I'm a young college president, I'm going to be too old. There's no in between. And in fact, you know, there's this middle of life where we're, you know, in the prime. And I just think that's a ridiculous concept. And I think, you know, what happens and what I just, what I'm hearing and what's interesting about your idea, this is kind of a sidebar, but, um, and you guys, I love to have these crazy conversations and hear people's ideas and see what happens and get you guys mixing it up and everything. And so, you know, it may be interesting to have, um, you know, our students obviously, you know, you guys have just mentioned this, you see that they might have something to offer and what you just said, I mean, they're horrible at remembering names. And I would gather that half of them, uh, I know this because I, you know, what's, you know, they don't understand the value of remembering somebody's name. And, and uh, I think uh, uh, more relationships, and I actually, the idea I had last night at dinner was um, uh, we'd have guru lunches where basically we would, I'd have somebody at the college or somebody in my office would basically connect with uh, maybe 10 people a week who would agree to have lunch in the cafeteria. And we'd be intentional that we're bringing Doris Kopic over and Dr. DeCourcy over to have lunch. And your job was to mix it up with students and students knew their job was to mix it up with you, to ask questions, to beat around ideas, to ask for advice. Because there are some students who are savvy enough who could sit down with you and look at your stuff and you could trust them to give you some basic advice. Um, and so, uh, and, and exactly right, and vice versa, where you all have, have lived lives and seen much more than they have and have expertise in areas that I don't know, I feel like I know a lot of you really well, but I don't know the half of it probably. And that's really valuable. And I would tell you, because of the work we're trying to do to connect with students' whys, everybody says, graduation, graduation, graduation. And I really believe that what's more important than graduation is what happens after. That's what, you know, that that's what we gotta, we gotta know what our, our, our uh, uh, pathway is through, you know, the right kinds of classes so that I can, be a doctor and do all this other stuff, but why do I want to be a doctor? And why do I want to go to graduate school? Why do I want to get a job? Do I, why do I want to have a service career? Why would, you know, there, there's this question of why, and it's hard for us to answer that question with students, you know, just us as a college. But if you were to spend some time with them and dialogue, it might help them to start sorting through all the crazy things that are are, are going through their, their heads. And because I think that one of our major initiatives that we're starting is we're trying to organize all the stuff we do that's related to mentoring, whether it's peer-to-peer, -peer, whether it's faculty advising, uh, internship advising, or just, you know, I think about it, because you now I think about, oh my gosh, you know, why don't we have a student connected with every single one of the households here? I mean, they'd certainly get, you know, pretty good food once a week, we know that. Uh, but on the other end, you know, think about the wealth of knowledge and support and love that you would get uh, otherwise. So let me wrap up and then uh, we'll, I'll have uh, plenty of time for questions here. So, so, so here, here's the thought, you know, with, with something like the Horizon Fund and, and what we're doing uh, so often, and I, I, know, I know you guys well enough and I know most, a lot of your brethren uh, to know that it doesn't take money to do a lot of these things. 
especially if you start batting this stuff around, you know, if, if, and that's, I've been a firm believer and it's been my philosophy since I've, I've, I've been in the president's office that we're gonna put our money in, into our people and we've done that. Our salaries are actually 50% higher, faculty 50% higher than not individual salaries, but the resources we're spending on people. We spend 50% more on people than we did five years ago when I, when I started. That it's, it's about our people, getting the right people, paying, you know, giving them the things they need and taking care of them. That they'll, you know, when you get a group of people together, they can come up with something that's better and cheaper. Um, and I don't mean cheap, cheaper is, everybody's going so well until I use the word cheaper, but I'm sorry. But you don't, it doesn't always take money to make an idea happen, but it definitely, definitely takes the right people. And so um, you've gotten a little bit of a, a flavor of what we're trying to do at McPherson College, and hopefully I've kind of brought to life the idea mm -hmm. of trying to connect liberal arts with entrepreneurship and some of the things we're doing and some of these discussions, that's how it goes. You can imagine we're in a conference room and a student stands up and we start batting stuff back and forth and you can't imagine how the ideas start to develop and, and work and uh, you start to imagine what can happen when you set somebody loose and you say, take a risk, try this, whether it's a faculty member, a student, it makes what we do a lot better. And so. The rest of the story about the museum, right? I told you I started a museum, that my, my very first venture. Well, um, I did shut down the museum, but I did not sell my baseball card collection until I was admitted to McPherson College. So when I was a student, my parents said, how on the earth are you gonna pay for college? And I wondered a little bit, and I went to my room, which had everything that I had ever owned in my life, and I looked around and I saw 37 Mark McGuire 1985 Olympic rookie cards, which I sold for $1,800 a piece and that funded my McPherson College education. So to my friend Rod Bry out there, you know, <laughs> it was a pretty good museum. So thanks for your time. I'm happy to st stick around and answer any questions you have. So. Any questions? I just want to say a couple things. One, I don't know if any of you watched the Senior Olympics on television the other night. I can't believe this. It was so inspiring. Here was this 102-year-old guy playing tennis and, uh, well, there was this guy who was, well, he was playing 94-year-old in tennis. And then there was a guy that was swimming who had had cancer and had, was taking chemo and he won the tennis, or I mean swimming, won the swimming thing. and. Uh, I, it's unbelievable. Well, some of them were doing high jumping. I thought that's ridiculous. You'll break your bones. And you won't even. But really, they were so into it and so upbeat. It was marvelous. And most of them were 90 years old or more. And then the other thing, and this goes way back, but when, when Dayton was teaching and our kids were in elementary school, he never said anything about the teachers they were assigned to because we wanted the kids to like their teachers. And one was awful. And I said, this art lesson, when I was there, I could not believe. Um, she handed out a mimeograph to Iris. And then they were to color this Iris. But then she said, you know that Iris are purple. <laughs> that was your art class. <laughs> Dave. Oh. We now live in the courts and seeing the, the many needs that people who need help are there and for anybody any student that would be interested in thinking she'd like to be a nurse even though we don't have nurse uh, courses they could come over here maybe i don't know and either volunteer or get small jobs helping the 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 residents just to see what being a nurse would be like so i i don't know we'd have to work it work it out some way but i i keep seeing the, the possibilities that could be helpful. I think one of the nicest things that's ever happened to us with the college has been when the students lived here. Yeah. Yeah. That, that was beautiful. Some entrepreneur a few years ago started online learning. McPherson College is a residential college seems to me like online learning is really taken off and i wonder what that does how does 
what do you do about that? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. And uh, I would tell you, there, there's lots of interesting things out there. And if you, if you dig in for an afternoon on Google, um, you, you'll get, you can get a pretty quickly a pretty good idea of what, what goes on out there. But just, you know, kind of, I'm assuming you want my editorial on it versus a lecture. Um, uh, b bottom line is, at some point, and I've got some good work that a friend of mine, Michael Staten, uh, he's, he, he went uh, uh, to a liberal arts college and he's got a startup in um, San Francisco around e-learning. Uh, it's a Facebook application that he runs and it helps more on the admissions and retention end. But he did an interesting white paper on the fact that um, technology is gonna make our lives a lot easier and it always has but it's not going to make our teachers better teachers. I, I believe that. I mean, it might make room so you have a little bit more time to be a better teacher, do the kinds of things, but it's not gonna make you a better teacher. And I would tell you that students love to be around people. And what are they gonna do? So they're gonna take, they're gonna have this online, you know, infrastructure, but where are they gonna live? There's always gonna be a place for community. And there's always gonna be a, a need uh, for students to go somewhere that's not home to get an education. And it may be, honestly, that at some point, I'm not suggesting this in any way, but it may be that students live here and they get, and everything's exactly the same. Uh, and they have faculty who maybe live with them, but do we care that their class is in Beijing or Seattle or that they're taking it online somewhere? Do we care that the content, but, but we still have faculty and staff and people who love them, who care for them, who show them the you know, uh, other side of the curriculum? It's hard to say where, where it's gonna end up, but there's always gonna be a place for students to come and be a part of community. Don't know, I wish I knew what that looked like. I wish I knew what, what um, uh, what the online piece, uh, how, how that fit. Um, but when you look at it, most of the online, people who are in full-time online programs, they're non-traditional types of students. I mean, uh, so it's not the, you know, the traditional age, but yeah, it's, it's an interesting challenge. Is there any reason, to me, I have a bias for, towards residential college. I'm not sure you can, uh, that experience is the same as an online experience. Is there any research out there that says, um, that proves one versus the other in I, terms of learning, in terms of the experience? I, you know, I'm not aware of any, I mean, I've read articles. I've, I've, I, I don't know of any studies necessarily around that, that it actually, I think what you asked is compared, okay, if in, what happens if in the future uh, st everything happens online and there's no physical contact? I've, I haven't seen anything like that, but I mean, come on. I mean, it, they're piloting some interesting things in Asia where they build these big complexes and faculty from all over the world and students from all over the world go and live there. They live together and they learn together and some of their content comes from online and you guys have heard of MOOCs, massive online, open online courses where there's tens of thousands of students and, and you're in one class with like the very best molecular biologist in the world and he's teaching a really super cool class and there's thousands and thousands. So the boundaries certainly on where we get information they're no longer, don't kid yourself. I mean, the way you do research now and the way these things come together are, I mean, it's so much different. But technology will never replace the experience a human being has in the maturing, growing up, however you wanna call it, process. Just can't happen. We can make the on, and I, I'm, I'm a person who says the future of the United States of America is in who, if we can own the most virtual real estate. Shouldn't be oil, shouldn't be, you know, you think of all these things that if we just control something, we control the economic, I think it's the virtual space, online. Now that sounds kind of far out. and well, So I, I believe that, that, that the way we, we, we transact business, the way we work, the way we live, uh, online is really, really critical, and if we ignore that, and if faculty ignore it, um, you know, they're gonna be in trouble. 
But I'm telling you, it's not gonna make them better teachers. It may give them more time to do things differently and focus on areas where they can be better teachers. They might spend their time more efficiently, but it's not gonna make you a better teacher and it's not gonna replace that interaction that we have. There is no virtual system that will ever become so um, uh, intelligent that um, it can do those things and do, do the kinds of things that lot, most of the colleges attempt to do. I mean, and it was interesting at our board meeting, we talked about uh, retention and how do we get our, our students better connected because our retention is bad. We're struggling, and everybody across the country is struggling with it. And it was interesting, one of our trustees, well, uh, Jim Loving was talking about his, his daughter went to, from Creighton, a, a smaller university, University of Kansas, a bigger un university. And he said, she's got two or three faculty that she's really connected with, community. She's found community even on a college of 20,000. And we argue that, so that every college who wants students to come and study they're gonna be making the same argument McPherson College has. And K-State's been making it, don't kid yourself, for 50 years that they're small and student-centered, and I think they probably do a pretty good job of it. Uh, but they're all making the same arguments and trying to change this whole thing at once. You know, it's gonna get complicated, but you'll never be able to replace that community building. Uh, and that's gonna be important from here until the end of time. That's my friend's study is like, we can fight certain things like um, you know, electronic books. Give up that fight. Give it up. I'm not suggesting we destroy books or anything, but books are going to be electronic, period. That's how students are going to get their information. Give that up. But don't ever give up residence halls and residential life and the student services models that we have on college campuses. You know, that's where we need to be spending, you know, that, that, those are the battles that are worth waging. So that's my two cents. I've been impressed with the students who have taken some investment money and uh, actually uh, uh, beat what the college is doing. And uh, anyway, I've wondered, I, I'm aware of the fact that the college has, or at least I understand, has the old Dillon's building. Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, wondering if the students, if you have a group of students who have figured out a use for that, a way to use that? You know, we, we, we've looked for ideas and um, we haven't figured it out yet, no. Haven't figured it out yet. The idea was when we got the gift, we we're going to turn an entrepreneurship center. And my agreement uh, that I kind of, you know, des decided that we were going to take the building, that the terms were. Um, it would be an on, something entrepreneurial and entrepreneurship center and that we would get outside resources, you know, government grants, whatever, to support that. Um, and everyone got turned down and we couldn't, and the other piece was we weren't going to distract all of you who are current donors with that project because it wasn't as high of a priority as student scholarships in the campaign that we're trying to start. And so we, we haven't found the resources to do anything with it yet. So it is up for sale if anybody is in you know, we like cash too, and um, and and again, that's a great story. Of, I had a great idea with that. I mean, I went pitched, pitched it, and you know, it was uh, if anybody from the Dillons Foundation is well, I think this would make a great story for Dillons that it used the old neon sign, Dillons Entrepreneurship Center, and my pitch to the to the governor and and to the, to the different groups in the state that we were working with on this is it it's, you know, we want to grow this. Uh, we want to grow ideas. We want to grow our own economy here. And the, and the, and the local government supported this, MIDC supportive of it, um, with the idea that we'd have so much activity there that we'd have to put the stoplight back up. And I mean, I was so excited about it, but I couldn't get anybody to write a check. Nobody, nobody bought the idea, and I wasn't going to use college resources that were already tied up. And so there's an idea that did not go anywhere. So. Other questions? You can ask questions about anything, too. But, hmm? I understand that you're a student now, and how is that going? And my second question is, uh, to, do you have to have a hall pass to leave your dorm and go visit your family? <laughs> I think you know the answer to the second question. <laughs> um, yeah. Um, no, you don't. And uh, I, I'll actually be in Philadelphia 
next week for a week for my boot camp where I basically take four classes. So I've, I've not showed up on campus and I've had to write over 200 pages already of assignments and stuff. And um, I'm understanding what faculty mean when they say rigor. So um, it's gonna be a lot of fun. So yeah, I'll be there for a week. And I'm hopefully, I'm hoping that some of the stuff uh, well, I know some of the stuff that I'm working on that's central to uh, what we've agreed as our as strategic importance of the college would be part of my dissertation. So um, it should be pretty exciting. I mean, it's it's a program where I'm in a um, post doc. I'm in a doctorate program, at University of Pennsylvania. It's a 22 month program. 23 of us from around the country will get together once a month for two days, and uh, then there's obviously all kinds of work in between and 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 uh, um, it's a great combination of online and you know residential type of learning, but it's gonna be uh, a really quick 22 months and at the end of the day, hopefully I have something to put back in the world. I mean, that's, you know, that's, that's what I wanna do with my dissertation, so. But it's going, it's going pretty well. I, um, I haven't showed up to my first class, but I'm still enrolled in the program, so I haven't gotten kicked out yet, so. Yeah, I mean, you never know how the, you know how crazy stuff gets connected, and we're not giving up on it, but any other questions? So again, th thanks for everything you do for the college. We, we appreciate your passion and your gifts and, and all the good things that you provide to us, and uh, um, students will be back in leaders will be back in a week and the athletes uh, will be back in a week and everybody else will be back in about two and a half so so enjoy your weekend thanks for having me <laughs>